Good evening. My name is Willie Poinsett, and I am a co-founder of Respond to Racism. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our monthly community meeting. We will begin our night, tonight's program, with a land acknowledgement that will be read by Jeremy Watson, Respond to Racism treasurer and a member of our leadership team. Today, I would like to honor the people whose lands we live on. The Malala, the Cayuse, the Tualatin Kalapuya or Atsalati, Willamette Tumwater, Wasco Wishram, Clackamas Chinook, and the other Chinook people of the Willamette area. We acknowledge those tribes as the original inhabitants of this land and recognize that we are here because of their forced removal from this land. Land acknowledgements are more than just explanations name checking the tribes and native nations whose lands we occupy. That is not enough. These statements help demonstrate respect for and awareness of the enduring relationship between indigenous people and place. Acknowledgements do not exist in a past tense or in a historical context. Colonialism is a current ongoing process and it behooves us to seek and build an understanding of our present participation. In our June community meeting, we learned so much about the horrific legacy of residential schools in our own region, thanks to the dedicated work of Ava Gugamos of Pacific University. In honor of that presentation, this organization has given financial support to the Naya Family Center of Portland whose mission is to enhance the diverse strengths of indigenous youth and families in partnership with the community through cultural identity and education. I am pledging to continually learn more about the work of the Naya Family Center, to continually learn more about those on whose land I live and work, and to deepen my understanding of the continued impact on indigenous people of my existence and to take meaningful action toward justice and empowerment of indigenous people. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Tonight's program will be about the school resource officers as viewed through the eyes of students. As always, we begin with sharing our mission, the mission for Respond to Racism is to educate and empower Lake Oswego residents and institutions with the tools to combat racism in all its forms and make Lake Oswego and Oregon a better place to live for residents of all races and ethnicities. We'd also like to give out a little gratitudes and acknowledgements. Last month's community meeting speaker on ethnic studies, Dr. Nate Barnes, and for our leadership team, they work and work and work tirelessly, or not so tirelessly, I can say at times, but we wanna honor and thank our leadership team. I'd like to thank the silent, silent walk participants. Every third Sunday afternoon, we gather at Millennium Park and have a silent walk, a meditative walk. And I'm happy to say that we've been doing it and we will continue to do it. Um, the people come out with whatever is on your mind that you want to think about as you walk in silence and in solidarity with the others. I also like to thank Don Ayami. Don puts together the events list that you get, that extensive list for the, each month of activities that are happening in our area that you may or may not want to attend, but you will have the information. And now it's time for our first poll of the night. Did you take at least one action to support ethnic studies? 
and let us know what you did by putting it in the chat. The chat will be enabled and so you can put what you did in the, for the poll, answer yes or no, if you did one action. Is our poll finished? Okay. Uh, we would also like to thank Bruce A. Poinsett for the oral histories that he did for some people who have been here in Lake Oswego for a long time. And he interviewed to them and also brought on a, a photographer. So we have pictures. The histories are up on the YouTube channel for Respond to Racism or the stories. Please read the stories. You'll see some familiar faces and you will definitely enjoy their stories. So uh, tonight, as we get ready to get into the meat of our business, meat of our meeting, let me just remind you of our agreements. Be brave, share ideas, ask questions, and engage in the conversation. Let others speak, respectfully listen to understand, and to be open to new ideas. Share your unique perspective and speak honestly. Critique ideas, not people. Ask clarifying questions. Respect each other's thinking and value their contributions. Honor confidentiality. Our, our expected outcomes will get acquainted with who is in the room and wanting to respond to racism. We won't solve racism in two hours. You'll leave the meeting sometimes with more questions than you came with. You'll have one actionable item and you'll have more ideas of how you can interrupt racism. I'm excited today or this evening to introduce the person who is going to be um hosting our our um i'm trying to try to say it <laughs> hosting our program and working with our students let me just say i get a little excited so excuse me it's my pleasure to introduce my son, Bruce A. Poinsett. Bruce is a writer, educator, and community organizer whose work is primarily based in the Portland metro area. He hosts Black Tastic Adventure, a virtual exploration of Oregon's Black diaspora, a former reporter for the Scanner News Group. His work has also appeared in the Oregon Street Roots, Oregon Humanities, and either Portland. 
as well as projects such as Mercatus Collective and the Urban League of Portland's State of Black Oregon in 2015. Bruce Poinsett also contracts with the University of Oregon's Equity and Inclusion Office and numerous Oregon nonprofits, as well as teaches journalism and creative nonfiction with literary arts writers in the schools program. And that's writers in the schools. In addition to his professional work, Bruce also works with Respond to Racism, a grassroots Oregon organization here in our hometown, here in his hometown of Lake Oswego, Oregon. He's my son, as I said before, so with much, much joy, I present Bruce A. Poinsett. Thank you. Take it away. Thank you. Starting on a, on a positive note tonight, because uh, <laughs> it may not stay there. But, but yeah, so tonight we're having a discussion. Once again, maybe you all remember a couple years ago, we had a student-led discussion on student resource officers or SROs. And I want to first of all, thank everyone for being here. I know a lot of you came in here, you know, to learn more, to hopefully stand in solidarity with students, especially students of color whose voices, you know, are structurally and often actively marginalized in this district. And anyways, to bring it back to the discussion. So two years ago, we had a panel, it was very, you know, panel presentation, it was informative. Also during that time, there was multiple petitions, including one by uh, LO Change that gathered, say, thousand plus signatures and included in their demands were, you know, reconsidering SROs. They had, you know, people, students who were, you know, part of larger campaigns to also remove SROs. In a lot of cases that, and we'll go through some uh, examples, but that's actually happened in a lot of districts surrounding LO, but somehow LO has gone a different direction. And, you know, personally, just as an alumni, I'm wondering why, because on one hand, I've heard from the district, you know, that things are essentially peachy, but I still get complaints from students of color, families about, I see people who have very little confidence in actually filing formal complaints because the only thing they think that's gonna come of it is retaliation. And, you know, just again, it's nothing, unfortunately, it's not surprising. It's the same Lake Oswego School District I remember when I was going to school, but it's disappointing. It's, it's very disappointing. And I gotta say that the response to this meeting from the district has been very disappointing. Uh, multiple people who are involved with tonight's presentation who've received emails from uh, Superintendent Sheely, effectively trying to intimidate people from telling their stories. And I don't think that's okay. I don't think that's acceptable. And, you know, the question is, why are we even having this discussion? That's why, because we need to talk about not just what, what is happening with SROs and what some of these concerns might be, but is the district, you know, as LO in these more recent years says it's embracing diversity efforts and embracing inclusion, embracing equity, how's that going in practice? Not just from the people in power, but from the people who are most affected. So that's what we're gonna be talking tonight, but talking about tonight. But first, to you know, bring people up to speed, because when we post this discussion, 
you know, I'd see like on Instagram, people say, well, what, what is an SRO even? So I got a video that can kind of up, you know, state of, it's from a couple of years ago, mind you, but it gives you a pretty good overview of this discussion, which is very much a national discussion. So I will share that right now. When I was in high school, there was always an officer around campus named Bradley. He was there every day. I assumed to protect and ensure safety, but I just remember him catching kids for cutting class. Now, I understand we all have our own personal biases when it comes to the police, but I never questioned if it was necessary for him to be at my school. I mean, cops are all over the place. I'm just used to them being around. However, after the killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and other black people by the police, there's been national attention looking at policing and police violence. And that attention has also spread to schools. Recently, many school districts around the country, Denver, Minneapolis, Portland, Oakland, and San Francisco, have severed ties with their local police department with more considering or voting on it. With increased awareness of police presence in our society, many are asking, should police be in schools? Today, it's pretty common for schools to have a security presence. 57% of public schools have some form of security staff, but not all security is the same. There's security guards, there's law enforcement, and then there are school resource officers, or SROs. They basically work in partnerships with schools. They're usually hired by a local police department, sheriff's agency, or school system. They're cops, so they can arrest people and carry weapons, but their main job is to keep the school safe. The big problem is that their training varies widely across the country. Nationally, there are no specific training requirements for the job, although the National Association of School Resource Officers, or NASRO, recommends that officers complete a 40-hour course that includes emergency plans for schools, de-escalation techniques, and academic work, including studying the adolescent brain. This is in addition to the nearly 700 hours you need to become a police officer. So how did SROs end up in schools in the first place? Let's take a look back. They first popped up in Flint, Michigan in 1953 as a way to strengthen relationships between youth and local law enforcement. But through the 1950s, there were less than 100 officers on school campuses nationwide. Fast forward to the war on drugs in the 1980s and 90s, when there was a big increase in juvenile arrests linked to the selling and using drugs. The number of officers in schools grew as tough on crime federal and state policies were passed, most notably the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act of 1994, also known as the Crime Bill. Then came the Columbine tragedy and a wave of other school shootings. Following Sandy Hook in 2012 and a wave of people freaking out about school safety, the Obama administration gave funding to 263 cities and counties of more than $125 million, including nearly $45 million to fund new school resource officer positions. Now, there's no official count of officers as schools don't have to report that info, but NASRO estimates that between 14,000 and 20,000 SROs are currently in service nationwide. Now, not everyone is stoked to have cops in schools. Organizers around the country have been fighting to remove them for years. Some people say that having police in schools doesn't really help stop crimes and can end up criminalizing students for behavior that officers aren't trained to deal with effectively. They also argue that having cops on and around campuses makes schools feel more like jail or prison. Specifically, when we talk to our young folks, our black and brown young folks from East Oakland, they feel that they are harassed and they are not in a position of power to speak up when they have these situations with SROs. That's Christina Flores, a young organizer from Communities United for Restorative Youth Justice, or Courage, based in East Oakland. For me, from my personal experience with SROs and law enforcement being on, school campus, um, I've always felt really paranoid and scared. And I felt like I was always constantly being watched so I couldn't mess up. Why is our constant or like a direct response is always calling like SROs and law enforcement? Anything you do, if you mess up, even if you don't mess up, if they think it's wrong, then, then it's wrong and you're kind of just targeted. Another downside of police in schools is that they tend to target black students. Take a look at the data. Black students make up 15% of school enrollment nationwide, but 33% of arrests. Compare that to white students who account for 50% of enrollment and 34% of arrests. SROs have also been accused of using excessive force or otherwise responding inappropriately to incidents involving young students. And that contributes to what is called the school to prison pipeline, 
which is when kids, especially those from historically underserved groups, are unfairly singled out, punished, and pushed out of school and into the juvenile justice system. When we push out young folks and, you know, those young folks then don't have time in school and their grades go down and they're most likely to commit a crime. And there's a saying where people like criminals, they're most likely then to believe that they are. Advocates want to take the money that funds the police and put it towards funding the resources that aren't cops. That includes restorative justice, counselors, therapists, nurses, and other support staff who can address safety concerns and conflicts. But that's not some magic cure-all. Critics also argue that these kinds of staff might not have the training on how to handle certain extreme situations, like if a kid brings a gun or drugs to school, or if an adult comes on campus with drugs or a weapon. When something like that goes down, you're gonna need a cop. So why not have that cop be an SRO who has special training to deal with students? These are very specialized positions. So when you, as a department and a school district, are selecting an officer to do this job, you gotta be really thoughtful in that. And we've established best practices for how you go about selecting that person. That's Mo Canby, Executive Director of the National Association of School Resource Officers. If you've got an SRO, I'll use myself as an example, who knows how to function in the school environment, has relationships with students and educators, and we have a disorderly conduct, or we have a shoving match or a harassment going on, um, you know, the majority of the time, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, you know what, if, if you guys can handle this, I, I, I really don't want to make an arrest, right? And that's the way an SRO typically is going to handle that. If you remove the SRO from the equation, now you're calling 911 or you're calling dispatch and you're getting a patrol deputy or a patrol officer come to the school to solve your problem. How many more times do you think that's going to end in an arrest for disorderly conduct? But like I said before, there's no national standard for how these officers are hired and trained. So results may vary with how they handle situations in schools. And it's also unclear if SROs actually do make schools safer. Juvenile arrests have gone down since the mid 90s, but you can't say definitively that that's the result of SROs. They might have played a role, but there are a lot of other variables. Crime all across America in general has been plummeting since around the same time. Now, regardless of whether SROs are or are not in schools, you're still left with a big problem. Bias that harms black and brown students when incidents do occur. You may have cut seven police officers from my school district, but you didn't stop the interaction or the criminalization of black people by police officers. That's Jamoke Hinton Hodge. She's been an Oakland Unified School District school board member for 12 years, who recently voted no on removing cops from campuses in Oakland schools. When you rethink how a school site officer can play a role as a culture keeper, understand what's happening for a young person academically, socially, mentally, spiritually, you then still have this system where over 50% of the teaching staff and even the support staff, even those nurses, even those restorative justice people, even your social workers are like non-Black folk that are being asked to engage with our young people and whether or not their implicit bias has been checked in any kind of way, right? What does their training look like? She's not alone. Specialized anti-bias and de-escalation training is a huge concern for many. That training needs to be implemented for all school staff who get involved in disciplining students. So there you have it. Just to recap, the data around cops in schools keeping students safe is inconclusive. The racial disparities in arrest and where those officers are disproportionately affect black and brown students. And advocates suggest reallocating funds and resources to services to better support students. While those in favor of SROs suggest well-trained officers can prevent serious crimes on campus and simply removing police from campuses doesn't remove policing from schools. Lastly, the other support staff that's being suggested may not be equipped to handle more serious issues like guns, drugs, or an adult on campus. But now we want to hear from you. Do you want to see an alternative to police on campuses? If so, what would it look like? Let us know in the comments below. As always, I'm your host, Miles Bess. Till next time, peace out. Okay, so that was just a little, again, overview. Take it out of the local context just for a second. But let's bring it back to, again, why is LO going in a different direction than some of these 
other districts. And what do, what do I mean by that? We'll bring the screen back up. So, for example, Portland Public Schools most are the largest district in the state. The limited school resource program. You people really, you know, protesting down to say Kaiser. More recent, uh, I guess, months, you've seen escalation at Gresham to the point where they finally paused their program. And what about, what about Ella? Let's go back to 2020. You know, we had a student, Emily Zhao, who was part of uh, Oregon Student Voice and their campaign to try and remove police from schools in 18 districts. And of course, PBS has fanned their SRO, so why won't Lake Oswego, which again details, among other things, that again, even had petitions from teachers, staff, and community members, or a petition, I should say, from teachers, staff, and community members, over a thousand signatures. And what has happened since then? Obviously nothing. And in some cases, if you ask certain people that, you know, everything has been resolved. Why do we need to have this conversation anymore yet? So, uh, again, as someone, and this is just be my speculation because they don't trust the district. And, you know, again, you got to go to, <laughs> I, mean, I don't know what power I have, but that's <laughs> people are desperate. And you even have a, you're the same, you have two officers. You also have, uh, if you notice the National Association or, or School Resource Officers from the video, and I wanna go back to that video for a second, but among other recent things with SROs, they had to cancel booking Sheriff David Clark, who's infamous for well, just self-hatred and just generally being just awful. <laughs> that people had to, including in this community, had to speak out against in order to get, you know, this appearance canceled. But even, even in this video, I'll do the, let's see if I can find the guy. Even then, I want y'all to notice this, uh, I believe it's a thin blue line flag that this person doesn't even have the presence of mind to take out in a video while talking about this subject <laughs> where one of the big issues is discrimination against black people and black and brown students. And for those who don't know, full time to, to uh, update everyone, but part of this thin blue line symbol kind of came in response to the Black Lives Matter movement and simply calling for police accountability. And instead of uh, you know, accepting that you get kind of a uh, hostile, <laughs> Hostile symbols telling people to shut up, essentially. But I digress in my spiel because tonight is about the students. So before I introduce uh, our panelists for this evening, I just wanna emphasize that uh, what these students are doing, especially those who are still in actively in the LO school district is not it's not a small act. This is an act of bravery because there is the real threat of retaliation. There's the real threat when, you know, we get off this call, you know, similar to the last time when, you know, the support is done and they're gonna be out there alone facing all the pushback. So I really, really am calling on you all in this call to stand with these students, to support these students to not let these patterns that happen in the school district where we isolate, minimize, and silence, you know, students who speak out, especially when it comes to matters of racism, when it comes to matters of just justice, to continue. I 
really want to emphasize that and throughout the evening also I'm also going to be encouraging you to write to the school district about this uh, SRO issue and in support of students and let me sure I get the link in the chat here it may not be activated So yeah, yeah, link in the chat, you can send letters and we have a template, which will be, or not template, but I should say it's just a sheet with an instruction, some example, or an example for you all, which I'll share real quick before we get started. So again, we'll be sharing this out later, but very simple, I need you to right to the school board. One of the things we get on issues like this is that, well, not enough people write and not enough people, you know, actually reach out to the school board about these issues. So let's be active. People are looking for action items. This is a rather simple one. And we even included an example here so you can take some inspiration from, but again, we'll be sharing that. In fact, let me Put a link to that in the chat as well. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists for this evening. So we can uh, go ahead and put them on the screen, then I'll just introduce you all uh, one by one. Or you can just uh, wave, I guess. Okay, so just just a minute. <laughs> and one more. There we go. So, yeah, I want to say your name. You can wave to the audience. And we'll start with uh, Sara Alkiram is a sophomore at Lake Oswego High School. She's part of the Respond to Racism Youth Empowerment Committee and other local organizations. So welcome, Sara. Perrin Tymon is a Lake Ridge High School graduate and rising college freshman. They're dedicated, they are a dedicated gun violence prevention and LGBTQIA plus rights advocate. Welcome, Perrin. Samantha Jarkin is a senior at LOHS, co-founder of the Latino Hispanic Student Union, member of YEC and 2022-23 school board student rep. She strives to better her community through listening to others and working together to create change. Welcome, Samantha. And lastly, but not least, Cameron Leland is an LOHS alum. She recently graduated from the University of Oregon with political science and planning public policy and management degrees. She's currently working as the permanent supportive housing supervisor for Homes for Good and house, the housing agency in Eugene, Oregon. Cameron also writes for RTR and is a member of the Black Professionals Networking Group in Oregon. Welcome, Cameron. So quickly before we get into it, and we have, uh, couple of alums, one more recently than others, and two current students. But you know, three of you have been more kind of like actively involved in this process. And you know, Cameron as an alum, you and I are kind of, you know, we're we know a time before SROs, but also one of the reasons I wanted to have you on here specifically is because I think something that's been very much missing from a lot of these DEI efforts is the input of alumni of color who are probably as position as best positioned as anyone to speak to the realities of dealing with you know structural racism in the school district and are also you know removed enough that you know we don't have some of like the intimidation factors that can definitely stifle people's ability to speak in forums like this and 
you know, something I would encourage and suggest to the district is to really, you know, tap into that resource. We're out here. And also some of our experiences, you know, post going into college, going to different places, more often than not, more diverse places than LO, which isn't hard, is that you also come with, you know, some more perspective that could be very helpful in pushing the city to where it wants to go. Anyways, with that said, place I just want to start again, we started talking about the response of the district and I just want to talk or hear from the students kind of who've been there through this past couple of years is, you know, basically from the district that, you know, how the people who speak in, are spoken, that there aren't really much complaints, but is that, is that the reality? And how's the process been behind the scenes? And anyone can start. Um, I guess I'll start. Um, so the question was, how is the process behind the scenes? And how do we feel about the school district saying there are no complaints? Um, speaking from personal experience, I don't think that's true. I was at the SRO focus group with the students that was held during the support seminar and PACER time in the last few weeks of school. And we were told to express our thoughts on the SROs. Honestly, we were told that the recording wasn't gonna be shared with anyone and to be using that information to tell the school district what the students think. Um, then watching back the school district recording or the meeting or whatever was happening, the presentation, the information was slightly skewed. Um, apparently students are neutral on SROs, but I can testify as to say that there was not a single neutral thought spoken during that SRO focus group. Everything that was said was negative and no one was in favor of SROs. I can add on to that. I um, run a student group for gun violence prevention at Lake Ridge High School. And we also have spoken to the school district on SROs. And I know that my entire club is against having school resource officers in our schools, um, as well as I personally was on the SRO focus group that LOSD had in 2021, which lasted several months via Zoom. And um, as one of the three students there, I can tell you that uh, students still were not a fan of SROs and wanted some solution that would not involve police in our schools. Yeah, and to that end, Obviously, again, that the response doesn't, at least the response from the district doesn't seem to be matching the sentiment that you all observed in these meetings. But as far as in general, just bringing it back to uh, the experience in school, do, do any of y'all have, uh, whether personally or maybe with peers, you all had experiences with SROs that you might like to share from this. Okay, I'll go again. Um, my personal experience with SROs is not positive. Um, some of you may know my brother has autism. It is very severe. Um, and this kind of veers off into how SROs treat people with disabilities. Are they, hand, are they trained to be able to handle kids with autism and other neurodivergent people? Um, and I can tell you the answer is no, from my personal experience. I have a brother who's been treated like subhuman uh, for having autism, who um, SROs just don't know how to handle. And we need better training in that area. And um, if we're going 
to keep on having SROs, the least we could do is make sure that kids with autism are, there's some kind of training for neurodivergent people. Um, my own experience with them is that they are not very friendly with them and they are not treated equally, which is something that the school district pride itself, prides itself on. And additionally, I've had friends and um, students of color be humiliated in front of other students in broad daylight in the middle of class. Um, there's a kid in our school last year who was arrested just in the middle of the school day. I'm not gonna go into like the specifics of that, but that must've been humiliating for him. He moved to a new school just to be arrested in front of the entire school. Photo this kid's arrest. He was a person of color, he was black. He was being humiliated and mistreated. Thank you for sharing that. And I appreciate you know, kind of your discretion as far as with other people's stories. I know that can be difficult, but yeah, that, again, these are things we're not gonna, you know, not gonna hear about in reports because again, people, as my experience, any complaints I've gotten, the res the resounding message has been, yeah, we don't trust anything to happen if we report this other than to be retaliated against. So it's obviously that's concerning, but I want to take this to another place as far as, because tonight isn't just about talking about the issues with SROs, but it's kind of a bigger issue in terms of like, how do we deal with safety in schools? And something I'm you know, curious about is just from all of you, like what, what are the things that actually do make you feel safe? Or like what, or what are your, actually before you say that, like when you think about like safety worries in school, what, what do you worry about? Anyone can take that on. <laughs> I'm happy to start. Um, obviously, one of my um, safety concerns in school is a mass shooting. Um, despite my knowledge that school shootings make up less than 0.5% of all gun violence, and that is very much not a realistic fear for me to have, especially in Lake Oswego, where we have so many common sense gun laws in place in the state of Oregon to protect us. However, that still is a fear that media and such has created. So uh, something that makes me feel safer is when we are able to speak to our social worker during active shooter drills and we have that resource available. We have communication with our teachers about how they're feeling about the issue as well. Um, some of the most genuine conversations I've had in school are with other students and our teachers and social worker in a safe space on how to actually prevent gun violence instead of um, simply having SROs in our school as a little barrier. Something that I worry about is uh, students of color never feeling safe uh, because whether that's from paranoia or just systemic racism, it's a mental toll and you we get really scared that no matter what, you're just never gonna be safe because you can be singled out because of your skin color. And Sam, I don't think that that's fair, um, That's a very real reality of being an isolated student of color in a predominantly white community. Um, that's something that I've experienced myself being an LO alumni, I'm sure Bruce can speak to that as well. There is a sense of isolation and I'm sure having an SRO um, in a community where there isn't enough of an established understanding or a relationship that's trying to be worked or developed with the students, um, that would not make me feel comfortable and safe as well. I went to Lake Oswego during a time where there weren't any SROs and I already felt uncomfortable and paranoid with the lack of representation. So I couldn't imagine having um, an actual officer on campus um, as well.
Yeah, so, you know, we talk about safety, kind of went in, there was some uh, examples as far as like things I actually do, but yeah, as far as uh, just like institutions or maybe even just like places, I know Perrin, you shared some, but anyone else would like to kind of just talk about again. What what is working to things, whether they're from the school or just having to be tangentially there that actually, yeah, again, make you feel safer in the space. Um, I feel safe in that our counselors are there for us. I think a big pro to being at the school district is that our counselors are great. Um, and they're part of what makes me feel safe. Um, I also, this is kind of veering off into a different vicinity, the student affinity groups and the GSA who are constantly, uh, the GSA, uh, hold on. Yeah, the GSA and then students demand action groups who are constantly fighting. Um, battles with administration, well, not necessarily, but like, and creating a better community for students of color and other things. I agree with Sara, especially affinity groups, and also just being able to be surrounded by people that look like you and who can relate to you. It's really hard in this district, especially with adults, but just having a moment to where you don't feel alienated because you're the only one who looks different makes me feel a lot safer and a lot less paranoid. And there definitely is something to say, um, interacting as a student of color with all white adults, there's a very interesting power dynamic that I think needs to be acknowledged. Um, it's a very privileged space to be um, in sitting down and being able to hear the experiences of students of color that are willing to be so vulnerable and share these things. And so I do think now as I'm older and I'm much more removed from the school district and I don't consider myself a student anymore, uh, those things really did affect how I grew up and the relationships I developed after school. And I think it's really important for adults to really consider the kind of communication and, and what the goal of your um, communication is. Are you trying to be combative to prove a point to hold legacy to make sure that the name of LO is not tarnished or is the goal to create space so that new um, kids and students of colors and families of color can actually have an open um, platform in which they feel safe. I think everybody's main priority in life is to feel safe. I don't think we can progress or move forward as individuals, let alone as a community, when we have people that don't feel safe. And so I do think that it's really important to acknowledge uh, as we're talking to students and young adults that they don't have necessarily, we don't have necessarily all of the perspectives that you may hold. And they often have different perspectives that you will never hold as a, a non uh, person of color. So I do think it's really, really important to be mindful of those dynamics when interacting with children, or, excuse me, students, not children. And Cameron, I'll just I think, continue to keep you talking, but, you know, as someone who's been able to kind of go through the university experience, are there any, like, resources that, you know, obviously, you know, budgets are very different, but any resources you've kind of been, like, exposed to on campus where you would say, oh, this would be great either for LO or like, this is something that like a place like LO could definitely take some inspiration. The presence or interference of any sort of um, teacher or administrative uh, person or um, faculty would probably create a safer environment for these programs to develop. Yeah, so I want to bring it back to back to the process. We kind of we talked a little bit about sort of the narrative around the focus groups and what was happening in them didn't really line up. But I am curious as far as like what what those discussions looked like, or in terms of like how they were set up. Because again, it's not just tonight, just to like you know bash the district. I do want this to be a constructive 
thing to you know reimagine how we're doing this. So yeah, can you all know, for enlighten me on what what was the setup like, both not in terms of not just like the student discussions, but like as a whole. I can speak to the ones in 2021. Um, that, those focus groups were not just students. There were students, uh, community members. There were um, school social workers from both of the high schools, um, some other fantastic administrators who I appreciate. Um, and as a whole, the session I went in, each session hoping for change because that was what was advertised at the beginning. It said very clearly, we are not sticking to the status quo. We will be changing something as a result of this focus group. Um, and throughout the process, even though I was primarily sharing stories of my peers and statistics that I know, not even my own personal experience for the most part because I'm lucky enough not to have a personal experience with the SROs. Um, the community members told me that I needed to get over it. Um, the community members in uh, uh, the session told me that if students felt like SROs were um, hurting them in any way that they needed to uh, learn better and just get over it. Um, and though the social workers were very helpful in uh, backing me up on that process. Um, there was very limited um, discussion afterwards of how that comment could impede our progress and similar comments were made throughout the entire process. Um, and we ultimately ended that focus group with no progress. Um, as for the focus groups in the last year, um, can't say much because they were supposed to be anonymous, but they were held by our student representatives um, as a anonymous space for people to share their personal experience and opinions on SROs. Um, about five students came, but it was advertised to everyone. We had 30 minutes to talk um, in front of the school psychologist and in a recording that was meant to be shared by the, um, the representatives uh, not shared by the representatives, but collecting de data and um, using that to share an opinion of the general student body. And this was all supposed to be anonymous with the presence of a school psychologist. Okay. And um, yeah, when I Again, it's hard not to you know, like hear these stories and start thinking about, you know, just again, structurally, because it's one thing to say, you know, this is open to everybody, but how do you actually, again, how do you get the input of those most impacted? Because, uh, yeah, if we were, I don't know, if I were just guesstimating, and you know, parents, sorry, you can again you know, fill me in on this. Like, like, what percentage of these focus groups were people of color? Just out of curiosity, like if you were just you were just ballparking it. <laughs> to be honest, it was a long time ago, so I don't think I could give you an accurate estimate. But I know that at least fifty percent of the people were white. Um, the Lake Oswego focus group, there was one white student out of the five. Okay. So yeah, actually like some sort of input. And in terms of, the, actually, parent, just to clarify, when you said like groups like 50%, you said like most of those were, was that like kind of like spread out or was that, was that focused in any area as far as like students or community members or anyone? Um, there were only three students. I was the only white um, student. The adults were primarily white. Okay. I was trying to get get a picture of these settings because one thing I've seen, and I go back to uh, 
even even the arc I was showing showing you all earlier from like Gresham, where even though there was a choice to pause the program, still one of the patterns you see in these uh, discussions, and again, part of it is just like you get who comes out to these, but the pattern is kind of like it's you know the majority like we're just by population numbers in majority white state. And you know, some cities that are even wider than that. So chances are you're gonna get who you're gonna, you know, get. But how does that shape how this is dictated? Again, how do you get to um yeah? I guess that, that brings me to the question as far as like what when we talk start talking about like what could the district do? to actually, you know, to actually make you feel like your opinion is being taken seriously in this discussion. Uh, maybe that might be a little bit of a big ask, but again, I want this to be constructive and, you know, helpful so we're not at this point again. So if anyone would like to, you know, take a stab at what they might envision for something more effective, something more, you know, that actually establishes a level of trust. I guess I haven't really been involved in a lot of the recent stuff, but I used to be pretty heavily involved with some other <laughs> um, actions there, and I've seen you around quite a bit. Um, I don't know, this is a very interesting meeting, and I'm really glad I joined um, as a parent in the district. I, I guess I've been to enough of meetings to know that there's definitely a power dynamic <laughs> um, that makes it difficult for, I would assume, um, persons of color to feel like they can actually be heard and have their opinions supported. Because when you're speaking to a room of adults who are in the position of power and authority, and none of them look like you, it's going to be really difficult to feel like your opinion is going to be heard. Um, the question was like, what would make us feel safe, right? Yeah, like what, you know, like what, what could the district do in these, be it these discussions, these interactions to again, like actually to, to kind of the point that was just made level that power dynamic so that it actually feels, because the sentiment I'm getting is that it doesn't really feel like an authentic discussion. For me, that's a very challenging question because I feel like to level that power dynamic, we'd need a bigger demographic of, a bigger support system for people of color in Lake Oswego. And I know that the majority of our administration, our staff, our teachers, the people who work in our school buildings are white. And as long as that's really in place, I don't know if that power dynamic could ever be truly leveled out, but I think a really big part of it is making sure that our staff, our administration, or whoever's going to be dealing with these kind of situations is educated. Maybe they don't have as strong as um, an implicit bias as others, or maybe they know they're trained. They're trained to deal with people who are neurodivergent, people who um, people of color who feel singled out in their community and they're trained to make sure that people belong. Um, I don't know if our SROs are trying to do that. I'm pretty sure they're not speaking on experience, but I think a big step into maybe moving away from the SRO program is creating some kind of position at our school district on a school-wide level, maybe that can help students feel like they belong, a place to talk to other students maybe. It's a very complicated question that we have to take a lot of factors into, including the demographics of our own district, which is really hard to touch on. I agree with you, Sarah, it is very difficult. Um, 
when I was in high school, I couldn't answer that question either because I had no idea what it was that I needed as a student of color. Um, but it is its visibility, its support, its uh, diversity amongst staff. And those are not just easy things to happen overnight. Those are community changes that are pushed for. Those are community conversations that are activated in these spaces. Um, I do think that there needs to be a stronger channel or third party platform in which there is more of an authentic, visible um, connection for students uh, beyond Bruce or beyond, uh, you know, student created coalitions that have to be um, facilitated through faculty because that is part of the rules that if you run student clubs is that they're facilitated by faculty and that kind of ruins the idea of um, sovereignty and that these students have a place to truly speak and to have platforms and raise awareness. I know during my time at school, I tried to create clubs and um, was part of different classes that were about uh, leadership and equity and change. And I felt a lot of those classes and even my own attempts at creating a Black student union were often co-opted um, by faculty, by um, LOSB in the sense that they wanted to create their own mission instead of allowing students to have their own sovereignty with their own groups. And so we do need to do a better job as a community in creating safer spaces for students to feel elevated uh, in their places and providing safe spaces for adults of color and the community to help support these students in the way that they need. I, I don't think that it's just all about um, excluding white voices because that's not it at all. The majority of our community is white and we can't not acknowledge that, but it's about how we can levy the power dynamics so it's equitable um, and so that these students that are sitting on this panel and I'm sure are very nervous, just as I'm sure Bruce and I are nervous as we always are having these conversations. How do we create these spaces so it's not so nerve wracking and so the students can share um, what they're feeling and so that we don't have to speak about these conversations in my prophecy. Um, the students that have actually been affected by SROs and the actual SROs should join the table and also be part of this conversation so we can understand what kind of trainings they have to sit through, what kind of advocacy levels are they at. Um, I do think it's important that all pieces are at the table when we have these conversations um, to help move that forward. Um, and the first step is through more solidified channels of communication for students and providing some sort of third party checks and balances so that students have the ability to speak out when something goes wrong. So, you know, some of the things you all just kind of described were, you know, tenants of at least, you know, of the schools that do have DEI departments and resources to that nature in terms of definitely isn't something that, you know, it's not a cure-all, but we talk about like institutional things that can address some of these issues and something else that's happened in the district that's, you know, related is that uh, the sort of, uh, I know there was, when Respond to Racism started around 2017, I'll say 2018, a uh, DEI director position was created. And then under the last superintendent, it got, I know they don't like to use the word demoted, but when you go from a director to a teacher on special assignment, that sounds like a demotion of power to me. And I'm kind of curious again, because you get conflicting reports, but in terms of like where you feel like you can go beyond, uh, beyond these student groups, because I think, you know, obviously it's important for you all to support each other, but in terms of like, what are the other kind of like DEI resources that are available in the district? It makes me sad as a former student to see you guys get so wide-eyed and um, not have any answers to that because that was something that I was pushing so hard for when I was a junior, when I was a senior, that we would do better for future students and to see that five, six, seven years later, it's kind of the same. It's very disappointing um, the community that we're not listening to our students enough and not 
allocating our resources and our conversations to the right areas. Like we're focusing on SROs when how many times do our teachers, maybe this is a genuine question, how often do you have to call the police for a situation in which students are involved or um, you have to get law enforcement involved versus how many times do you have situations among students where racial slurs are thrown at each other or students are being targeted for their um, sexual status and gender identity. I just, that makes me wonder if we're focusing on the right things. Thank you for that. And I know I asked that last question, I saw wide eyes and shaking heads, but um, yeah. So when, when something comes up, whether it be you know, in the classroom or, you know, again, cause I think, you know, these issues when we talk about you know, discrimination, like that's also a safety issue. Like, so how do, you know, how do you deal with that? How do you navigate things such as, you know, that real worry about retaliation? Um, I'm really struggling to put it into words because when some things do happen, I feel like I am not adequately trained to handle it appropriately if that makes sense like there's no place i can go to learn how to handle someone yelling racial obscenities at me like there's there's no article on the internet that tells young brown kids how to deal with that and as someone who's an underrepresented community a muslim who has faced comments at our school before I would say I haven't always handled it the best because there's no real way to handle it in a constructive way, if that makes sense. So really what I do is I jump to defending myself because I know that no one else will defend me. Sorry, can I ask what that looks like when you have to defend yourself and you don't have to go into anything personal, uh, nothing that could be triggering. I just, what is that? feel like and what is that like as a student to have to defend yourself? Um, sometimes it's reality, retality. Sorry, my brain is not working. Uh, I don't know how to say the word, but I'm pretty sure you might have, you know, coming back, I guess. Um, and sometimes it's ignoring because that's what the best way to handle things sometimes. And then other times I feel like I have to be a teacher and educate people on why they said was wrong. Um, but I would say most of the time it's being defensive and saying things back that, because at moments like these, people really underestimate how small you feel. You feel like you're really against more than just the person who's calling you or yelling at you racial obscenities, you feel minimized at times, right? So the response is just, it's out of anger, it's out of rage. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing. I asked that um, only because I was curious about how much emotional energy you have to focus on in terms of retaliating and getting your own defense instead of focusing on how to be more a part of the community or how to get to the school. That was something I struggled a lot with as a student um, and not feeling like I had a safe space because I spent more time trying to figure out ways to create a safe space for myself and for other students that look like me versus focusing maybe on what teachers and other parents would consider to be the normal school things. Um, I think that's a, a very big struggle for students of color in this district. Mm. I have a question, you know, it's been a couple of years since we've been able to be together and I'm sorry, I, I popped out for another meeting and am back now, but so I missed part of what we were talking about, but do we still have, you know, the little booklets, remember Willie, the little, the little, those little 
full up book list, how to respond to things. Do we still have any of those? Yeah, we hand them out at YC. We, we have okay. lots of them. Oh, okay. Just So Cameron, I really appreciate you kind of bringing up that point as far as emotional energy. And I'm actually curious if Sam or Perrin can also speak to, yeah, what kind of, uh, in terms of just how much emotional energy you feel like you have to expend on dealing with stuff like that, that uh, maybe, maybe your other you know, peers don't as much, or like, I guess, like how it affects your ability to learn. Or we can move on. <laughs> so, yeah, another uh, point we've got, you know, a little community here tonight. And I think another, again, just sentiment that seems to be you know, recurring here is this feeling of kind of like the isolation. So, you know, we talk about, you know, how the district can help or how the district can, you know, at least attempt to hopefully level the playing field if that's possible. But as like a community here, as you know, both people on this call, but as well as you know, our surrounding networks and all the people that you know usually attend these calls and everything, like what are some things we can do to, you know, help you out or stand with you so that again, you don't feel like you're going into these meetings, these interactions alone, or that, um, yeah, so that, you know, there's a more, again, a more level playing field. Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? Sorry, muted. Anyways, yes. Uh, yeah, basically, like, how can the community here both respond, LO, actually, you know, how can concerned community members be uh, more supportive? How can we help you? And so again, that you don't feel like you're kind of going into these fights alone. First, I genuinely feel like this is a question we should be asking the community. How can the community support students of color so that they're not too like them? Um, and I know maybe we don't want to answer for traffic open feed, but I feel like as a community, we should be supportive and not looking at students of color or families of color as the educators for our community. Um, I know that a lot of people's experiences in this kind of community are very limited and narrow, and that we might be your first, but you don't need to publicize that. And that's for you to take and go home with. Um, I also think it's really important that when there are focus groups that are created about SROs, that we're being authentic with the information that's being shared in those groups and making sure that we're doing something with the information that's shared. If students are concerned about their safety in, in schools, and how the SROs are affecting their safety, especially a disproportionate um, rate for students with disabilities, neurodivergency, students of color. Um, I think that that's, that's something that we should just kind of skip over. That's definitely something very important. And I feel like that's where the conversation should go next as far as the SROs go. Yeah, thank, thank you for that, Cameron. That's a good point even you know, again, it's still taking the discussion. I think that it's a great reframing where, you know, we sometimes all fall into 
some of these uh, same traps <laughs> in terms of our problem solving. So again, I, I appreciate that. So just to make sure we have uh, cover some different bases because I know uh, Perrin, you're involved again with students demand and, you know, things. Uh, something that's kind of like come up just to bring it back to the issue specifically when we talk about uh, safety around gun violence is I think, you know, we've all kind of seen the fallout from the Uvalde shootings and, uh, you know, again, I, I want to say 20 some odd people, mostly students, a couple teachers were murdered and you had police officers basically standing around and in a lot of ways were just they could have intervened but didn't and seemingly every week since then we've had stories about you know there'd be like footage or you know stories of things that people were doing instead there's been retaliation against parents who spoke out and actually while we're here because that did uh actually never mind i uh, do that but i know uh, i think it's either students demand or moms demand or maybe both of the networks had put out some stuff like when kind of the talking point came about well this is a reason for more sros to kind of put out something countering that with other i guess like suggestions could you uh yeah just share that with the, the group <laughs> Yeah, of course. Um, first of all, as you were saying, we have seen time and time again that SROs do not prevent school shootings. They do not minimize deaths or um, uh, injuries in school shootings. There have been studies shown that there is no evidence that they've helped whatsoever from 1999 to 2018. And now we've continued to see these mass shootings in schools and there's still no evidence that SROs have helped. So uh, what we need to be focusing on instead is to make sure that gun violence doesn't get to our schools in the first place. So we have extreme risk protection orders here in Oregon that allow a family member to um, have a firearm taken out of a home if someone is showing warning signs um, that they might be a harm to themselves or someone else. That's information that our school counselors should know about um, and they don't. I've been talking to administrators and I had to explain what an extreme risk protection order was to them. So that's an easy way that we could be um, implementing some of that violence prevention in our communities with an existing policy. Um, other things that we could be doing are uh, like a safety coach or someone who can work with students who is not armed, who is not affiliated with the police and can talk to them and build trust with them. Um, as more of a community member on how to channel feelings, not through violence. Um, that's a program that we've seen work time and time again with threat assessment programs. Um, we have all kinds of stuff with secure storage to go home to parents and make sure that students are not able to have firearms or access firearms from their homes, their friends' homes, their neighbors' homes, because most of the time, anyone who will try to start a shooting in a school is a student or former student. And most often they have shown warning signs and they got the gun from their home or the home of a neighbor or a friend. So if we can take those um, already existing policies and spread that information more to the community, we can be preventing gun violence from the source instead of focusing on a reactionary measure. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And yeah, I think we'll be wrapping up the uh, general discussion part of this, but I just would like to open it up to you all before we move on to the Q&A portion there, if you have any final shot, ah, final thoughts to share with the people, yeah, before we do some Q and A.
I think just to say that there should have been more students present in this process the whole way. Um, I'm constantly disappointed to see so many of my peers who know nothing about school resource officers or fully support getting rid of them, but refuse to speak up for it. And I think that can be fostered by more conversations for those of you who have children at home with them about school resource officers and how they're feeling about them um, and ensuring that we're able to better voice our concerns with our parents, with our teachers, and gain the confidence to be able to speak to our administrators about them. Okay, so with that, we're going to open the chat back up to do some questions, but I'll remind you again that part of tonight is, again, encouraging action. So again, I remind you, please write to the school board, especially, you know, any stories, any of these things about could be the SRO, the discussions around the SRO, how these focus groups are setting up, worries about retaliation, especially, worries about lack of trust, especially. Please, again, make, you know, make your voices heard. You know, kind of as Cameron pointed to, we can't just put it all on the students to come up with, you know, the solutions to these problems. So, for those who didn't get it before, I'm gonna put the link in the chat again. And yeah, hopefully we can open this up. Okay, it looks like the chat is open. So what we're gonna do is, uh, yeah, we'll wait for some, hopefully some questions to come in. All students tonight, you know, it's like, the, open to you know take questions and have a little discussion. there is a question bruce from esther mm -hmm. um, esther wrote in the chat every student deserves a need to feel safe at school what measures uh is the losd taking to help that become a reality i think that's a great question esther So another, oh, I should probably clarify as questions for the students, but it is also important info for people from the district who are here tonight. Anyways, uh, for the students, if you'd like to basically pick and respond to any of the questions in the chat, please. Uh, I do want to respond to Sandy's question. Um, they wrote in the chat, much of the discussion centered on uh, Black, Indigenous, person of color students, uh, I just lost it, feeling unsafe or a target of bias. Would it be different if an SRO was a person of color? I think the difference in what I'm hearing from uh, the students with experience with SROs is the lack of relationship, lack of understanding the kind of training this person has, um, I think the presence of just authority versus the goal is to be a resource for the school. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of different dynamics that may change how people feel about SROs or um, the intent and purpose if, if there was more of a clear directive. It sounds from based on this panel and my discussions that I shared with the students is that it's not clear. And it just seems like it's supposed to be a present and a force. Um, a good question was put in by Joni Delman, who says, what other actions can be taken? I would say continue to testify at school board meetings and right, just keep talking about it. Make sure that it's still on the agenda. Make sure that it doesn't get put on the back burner. And that's how we can keep trying to get rid of SROs or trying to move forward in, act in our action. I can respond to the question about are students so overly busy that it gets pushed to the back burner? I think that does play a part, but I think also it is primarily that we're expected to 
either not speak up or to be an expert on everything. And I've seen that present when speaking to administrators, especially when there are adult community members present, that if we are not an expert on the situation, the policy behind everything, and we're expressing our own feelings and experiences, we uh, lose credibility with those people in positions of power. So I think in order to adequately have students involved and be willing to be involved in those conversations, there has to be more work done to dismantle that system of power. I also want to point out Esther did follow up on her question. She says that the superintendent is present uh, and wants to know if the superintendent would like to uh, answer to what the LSD has done in terms of any of the SROs and why they haven't pushed to get them removed. Yeah, if uh, Superintendent Cheely would like to respond to that. Sure, I can respond to that. Um, thank you. It was great to hear from all of our students today. We were, as the district, asked to just listen today, so I wasn't prepared to talk about anything. Uh, but I can tell you, as far as feeling safe, we have added um, additional counselors at all of our schools, as well as uh, five social workers now. So we are trying to create more um, adults in the building that kids do feel safe to go with to address a lot of the ongoing mental health um, concerns that we have with our students for our students. Um, also, when it comes specifically to SROs and monitoring and reviewing, what we have made a commitment to be doing is the regular feedback from students. So we are going to have a yearly evaluation. We are going to have a survey that goes out to everyone. And then we're going to have um, uh, listening sessions with our students twice a year. And those are going to be with our students and our school psychologists. Again, very similar to the way the other meeting was held so that we can hear from, from students and how they're feeling about um, the SROs, how it's going, and really building those relationships. One of the things that we heard a lot about was that students were, were not really sure what their role was. So we feel like it's really important to make sure the roles and responsibilities of our SROs are out there in front of our students so they know what they do and what they don't do so that there is no fear around um, the, the security and the safety in our schools. Dr. Shaley, I really appreciate you coming out to speak today. Um, but I do have a follow-up question. I know you're not the one answering the questions, but you were mentioning something about focus groups and surveys, but what happens when the feedback from those focus groups and surveys is not exactly positive? What are the next steps? Mm -hmm. I for one am not super educated on what the LOSD plan is for one for this improvement, what the timeline is. I would really appreciate like if you could just clear that up, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Sure. Well, feedback that we get on a lot of issues is, is not always one way or the other. So there's always room for improvement. And so one of the things that we were trying to work on with the students is, you know, what is, where is the fear coming from? Because if it is something of people are worried about being retaliated against, that needs to be addressed immediately. <laughs> that is not okay. And if you're not comfortable talking to your administrator about that, I definitely would want you to talk to a social worker or a counselor, as I think some of you have talked about. And um, so what happens when it, if we can't improve it, then, then that is when you go away. That is when we don't no longer have a contract with the police. But at this point, all of the concerns we felt like were things like, we don't know what they're supposed to do. No one has told me how I'm supposed to act when they come up to me. And so, for example, for that, we tried to get them this year to build more relationships with students. So if you saw they were, they were attending more of your um, clubs during lunchtime or during pace or time or pace time. I mean, each school calls it a little something different, but so we were trying to get them in with students so they could see that these people are regular people who care about you. And it's just another adult in the building. I know that's not going to solve all of the issues. And I know it's not going to make everyone feel um, safe just because they're there. But we were trying to build the relationships and see if that could help and make sure people know what they do and what they don't do. So that's kind of where we started with it. I can tell you we have a two-year contract with our um, SROs. 
So the next time that would be up would be in two years from now. Um, and every year we will be reporting back to the school board, which we've had three meetings on SROs this year during school board meetings. And so we're gonna continue to do that. And as I mentioned, they're very interested in hearing about what happens, not only from the focus groups with students, but also the survey that goes out to all families. And they really wanna make sure that we're you know, doing these listening sessions so that we can have that lived experience of our students because they're there for safety. So if people are not feeling safe, that it's, it's not working. Thank you for answering that question. I really value that. Thank you. Yeah, I'd actually like to follow up on that in terms of how is the district, I'm just curious, is the district open to like an independent audit on this? I think it might be reasonable to wonder, you know, if complaints do arise and the district is investigating itself, how can that be a you know, fair result? Hmm. Um, that's a great question. I don't know that the district is against having a outside audit on something. I, I think what's hard is we have complaints every day about something. So we can't always afford to go out and get an independent auditor every time someone has a question. So that would have to be something that the board would have to consider and weigh the cost versus, um, you know, what information we would gain from that. And isn't structural racism pretty long standing though? I didn't think that was just an every, do you get everyday complaints about your SROs? No, I mean, we get complaints about a, a lot of, a lot of different things. <laughs> it's not about SROs. In fact, I, I'd be more concerned that our students are not, um, you know, feeling comfortable coming forward and giving us complaints about SROs because we, we don't receive a lot of those complaints. And I do want to say, I mean, in some of the, when you talk about institutional racism, we have, you know, we've had an equity audit, which we did complete last year. Um, some of the information from that is um, we're working on with our new consultants engaged to change to try to address the things that have come out of that audit. Are you in a position to talk about where, if at all, were SROs addressed it, or addressed in that audit? Um, SROs are, were not brought up as a main concern in the equity audit. It, they actually weren't brought up as a concern at all in the audit. Interesting. Thank you for that. We have more uh, questions in the chat. Yes, yeah, now whether it be for the students or for uh, Superintendent Sheely. So this, this last question, this most recent one. What have SROs done specifically that would demand their removal from the schools? I've not heard a list of specific egregious actions or behaviors or any SRO actions really specifically that has led or leads to structural racism. Well, um, can I start off with that one? Is that okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, first of all, this is a very public place. There are like 40-ish people here. And I don't know if all of us will feel comfortable addressing our struggles with racism and ableism on a very public forum that is being recorded because those are very personal and private instances. Um, if you are looking for a broader answer to that question, I would highly suggest looking up online the, the story of a five-year-old autistic boy who was arrested by an SRO for having a tantrum a thing that normal five-year-olds do, or the story of a 13-year-old black boy who was arrested for throwing a rock in a pond or something like that. Um, 
But, you know, I don't know if anyone on this panel would be comfortable sharing their personal experiences, although I understand where you're coming from. I can add that also what we've seen is that SROs simply aren't necessary in the first place, so that we should be looking at uh, reconsidering their role in our schools, because I have had experiences where my friends have come to me crying after being interacted with um, uh, with the SRO, after being pulled into an office, after them visiting their classroom, um, for a variety of reasons that I cannot accurately describe because they weren't my experience. But if you talk to a student who has had that experience, you'll see that it's present. I did put a comment below in the chat. I'm just hoping that the question's a genuine question and not something to just kind of incite um, emotional responses. Um, we spent the last hour and a half, almost two hours, talking about how um, SROs specifically, there were focus groups done about how students feel on SROs, and there weren't any positive uh, feedback, and that information was shared uh, with the community. It also was shared, I guess, with LOSD in a way that it has improved the relationship among students and SROs. So I do think there were quite a few um, examples that were mentioned by the students today um, that kind of contribute to why SROs are negative for LO specifically as a community. So we got a comment here from Mylene, or the, the whole thing's not showing up, so my, my apologies. But if you don't mind me sharing, right? I attended one of the parent focus groups during the equity audit in November of 2021. I thought the questions would be about diversity and equity. Instead, the very first question we were asked by the host was, what are our concerns about school safety? How secure are all staff and students? I specifically brought up my concerns that SROs decrease the safety and security of students. The follow-up question was, is there any kind of gang activity? This was a DEI focus group. When we, when we asked what that meant, the host said, you know, graffiti, inner city stuff. Participants in the focus group had to tell the host that we were upset to be spending our time on these questions that we wanted to discuss diversity and inclusion. And then we have another question for the superintendent from Esther. Have I, I've seen nothing in the press about how LSD made a decision to keep SROs in school. Can the superintendent tell us? Dr. Sheely, would you like to respond to that? Sure. It just let me unmute. Um, that's a great question. We actually had three board meetings this school year where SROs were discussed, as well as um, the the groups that that worked with the students and the clubs that worked with our SROs this year, and a survey that was sent out. And all of those were discussed in the June meeting. And I might have the date wrong, but it was in June that they we re-signed a contract for two years with our SROs. So I think if that's what you're asking, that's how that decision was made. It was made through having discussions at school board meetings um, about what the SROs are doing, what they're not doing, the concerns that came up during all of our surveys and student focus groups had more to do with the things I mentioned earlier about the roles and responsibilities, um, the training that SROs have attended, and then the collaboration and review of how it's going every year. And so that's how that decision was made. And as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna be having ongoing feedback. So regular meetings with LOPD, a family survey that's gonna go out um, every year. And then we're going to have two listening sessions at each high school that are going to be each semester.
Okay. Do we have any more? Uh, yeah, people who are still on the call, do we have any more questions for our panelists or the district tonight? While we're giving it a couple more beats, I'll remind you again, please do not just write the district, but again, it's also an option to testify to, you know, again, write letters to the LO Review, organize protests, feel so compelled. But think, you know, we've heard, uh, the solution about keeping the conversation going. And it's important, especially as the issue is not resolved, that you know, we keep this uh yeah, keep this in the forefront, keep this discussion going. So then another question is and, and anyone can answer this if you want, but what do the panelists feel the most important training components for training SROs are? I think for me, some kind of training on implicit bias, how to combat it and such and such. And then also just, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, I agree with Sara. And I also think that um, SROs need to focus a lot on empathy because I think they forget that not everyone looks like them and there's it's really hard to not be scared by them even if they're trying to be nice to you and trying to make connections because they're like six feet tall and older than you and they look nothing like you and then they get defensive as to why you might be scared of them. Do you want to share? I genuinely feel that um, for an SRO to be an effective uh, individual in schools, they need to be seen as like any other social worker. Uh, they need to go through trauma stewardship. They need to understand their diversity, equity, inclusionary lens, and implicit biases, like the very bare minimum of that kind of stuff. Uh, but on top of that, being in a community, especially in a district that prides itself on uh, embracing all different learning abilities and their urgency, there needs to be extra um, elements and layers for our students that we um, do have in our community. And I would say that, like, us we does have a larger um, uh, presence of students with uh, different abilities and their divergencies and something that we kind of pride ourselves on as a community. Um, but the bare minimum you know, about stuff seems to be happening. I think for this conversation to move forward, it sounds like there are some people that still don't feel that there's enough um, understanding of what specifics the SROs are doing that's making them a negative impact in schools. And so maybe it's worth responding to racism myself, uh, doing some uh, journalism and trying to understand and interview students and families that have had negative experiences with these SROs and also um, getting to understand the SROs themselves, who are these individuals, who are they for our community, um, we're all community members that care and that are passionate about the well-being of our students and the future generations. And I think it's really important that we take the time to invest and understand who is educating our future, who are these people in our buildings, um, part of the most formative years of our uh, young generation's lives. And so I do think it's really important that we as community members also take stock. So I know that I will be doing my share and trying to follow up with students of color and families of color and anybody that's been affected uh, negatively through these SROs, so I can further understand, I help myself understand the experiences and why they're negative. And so I just, yeah, Dr. Sheila, if you don't mind, one more question, but uh, 
that we brought up this again one of the potential ideas resources responses to some of these structural issues being like more DEI resources a DEI department and I, I'm curious what the obstacles are to building that out in the district is it just budget or yeah uh, that's a great question too, Bruce. I don't know that I think that there's any huge obstacles to building up that department. I think it has more to do with the structure of the department and creating something um, that the community, the students, the families, the staff know how to utilize correctly. Um, you, you had some examples earlier of, um, and we've gone through a couple of directors or and then um, Teresa was an, is an administrator, so her she's been elevated back to that. And as most of you know, she's now um, when in one of our schools, which she's amazing. So I'm super happy that she's able to be there and work on the ground with our students. Um, and right now we're trying to look at it with our new consultants from Engage to Change to figure out like what is the best structure for this because. The reality of it is equity has to be in everything we do and it can't stand alone in a department and so it's important to us to build it up correctly instead of just putting a person saying that's your job because that's that doesn't work it hasn't worked for our district and so we're really trying to build it up from from the base and i think getting a stronger foundation in how it affects everything that happens in our students to make sure that the culture of belonging is for all students is is the best way we can go about this and sometimes that takes a little longer because we're trying to, to build it, but I'm hoping that our work with Engage to Change is going to help us do that. And that's just an organization equity group that we have hired to kind of help us and from the board to the administration to figure out what is the best way to build the system that's going to ensure that our students all feel like they're safe, that they have a an adult they can talk to that they not only can you know belong to Lake Oswego School District, but they contribute to why we're excellent. And I think all of our students have the right to do that and be that. And, and so that's what we're trying to build right now. Thank you. So yeah, I'd just like to invite the students. If there's anything else, any final thoughts you'd like to share for the evening before we turn it back? Well, again, uh, thank you all for, again, it's not a small thing to do this, to speak out on this. And yeah hope that you know, the community, those of us on this call can you know, stand behind you and support you. So that we will conclude the discussion for this evening and I will turn it back to the president. Will we? Lily, you're muted. Thank you, Bruce. And thank you for the students tonight. Thank you for all of you who are on the call and for your comments, um, Dr. Shealy. I hope you, that you know that Respond to Racism stands ready and able to help you. And so please, um, let's have a conversation and talk about how we can help. I, you know, I had my little ears, having had Bruce go through the Lake Oswego schools is when I hear the racial names and the things that students of color have endured in the past and it seems like they are still happening that there's some help that's needed and maybe 
getting some people that look like them might help to have a have that conversation. So I'm offering myself and others who might want to join in to help. Okay, we have one more poll. Are we ready? Poll um, number two. Sarah's gonna read the poll. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> and then Pat will take over. So uh, our second poll for the night reads, I am able to commit to do one of the following. Submit my letter to the board by the end of the week. Encourage the youth in my life to talk about their experience with SROs and encourage the youth in my life to join a student organization such as the Youth Empowerment Committee and speak up about changes they would like to see. Speaking of the Youth Empowerment Committee, um, me and Samantha are the co-chairs of that. And if you have children at home, please, please do not hesitate to reach out to either one of us to see if they would like to join the Youth Empowerment Committee. The Youth Empowerment Committee is geared towards people of color and their allies, specifically students of color in the Lake Oswego School District. And um, we're a support system for students of color and we plan fun events and have meetings. And we really like to have your students, your children there. Um, you can contact us at our Instagram, which is at RTR underscore youth. So John, did you put up the poll? It's still going. You want me to turn it oh. on? Okay. No, sorry. I just don't see it at my end. So. The polls ended. Well, thank you all. Um, thanks for joining us um, this evening. Next month, um, we're having a, our special session to work around um, schedules. It'll be on September 6th, and we will be addressing um, book banning. So <laughs> that'll be another interesting session. <laughs> um, so please join us next month on September 6th. And starting in October, we will be doing some um, BIPOC women's series that we are hosting with Mary's Woods. And so there will be live sessions um, starting in October for about five months um, with a break in December. So we'll be putting out information on that as well. So thank you and have a good evening.